proud to be black, y'all. And that's a fact, y'all. And if you try to take what's mine, I take it back, y'all. All right, we get our uh, blood flowing this morning. That was uh, Run DMC, legendary group. Proud to be black. Apologize, I thought I was playing the, the radio edit version, but you know, they tricked me. But anyway, that was Proud to be Black, classic track by Run DMC. I was actually surprised to hear this song because, you know, Run DMC, they have a history of uh, walking the line. They just entertain us. But, you know, I was happy to hear this song, you know, when I was a baby. It came out in 86. So, man, I was, wow. I wasn't that much of a baby, you know. But anyway, uh, Proud to be Black by uh, Run DMC. And we started before that, Tragedy Gaddafi, a.k.a. the Intelligent Hoodlum, uh, Black and Proud. Man, in the 80s and 90s, we had a lot of progressive music. Man, can you imagine coming up in those days where black music was, con was intrinsically, inherently conscious? And of course, a lot of these rappers came up out of their parents were, um, were uh, of the civil rights era. And whether they were black power or integration, they were people who, uh, who challenged the system, who, who not only believed but took actions on those beliefs that they could change the system. And, and uh, also there was a strong sense of uh, collective responsibility. So all the rappers, even James Brown had to come out and say, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. So even if you was faking the funk, you was faking the funk. We nowadays... Rappers fake the funk like they rich. They fake the funk like they gangsters. They fake the funk like they pimps when they really not. And back in the day, they used to fake the funk like they was black conscious and pro-black and down for collective struggle. So if the funk must be faked, I prefer this type of faking of the funk. That's just my opinion. But we're going to move on today. Good morning, everyone. As I always say, I'm broadcasting out of the city of Chirac. And now... They're saying it's, it's, it's truly Chirac because we got a bunch of uh, uh, tribalism going on here. We got, you know, Shiite Sunni level uh, divisions here in the uh, city of Chirac. And uh, the, the uh, legendary um, journalist, Chicago, he's old and retired, but he's still every now and then he'll, he'll, uh, he'll come up and, 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 and share some of his insights after... Uh, following and, and writing on Chicago politics for over a century, for longer than I be, a, half a century, I'm sorry, longer than I be alive, uh, Dick K. You know, I was, I was reading some of uh, Dick K, and, and um, he said that this election, this past mayoral election was a tribal election. It was the most tribal election of all time, which would surprise me because when I moved to Chicago, I was told that I was moving to the most segregated city in America. The city that was overlooked by integration, the city that was overlooked by desegregation, the city that was even overlooked by many of the civil rights achievements and uh, reforms and programs. And I have to admit, being the horrible person that I am, that was an incentive to move to the city. Yeah, I said it. I'm not for integration. I understand through my study, through my research, through the people who educated me, that proximity to white folks is not power, liberation, or even betterment for black folks. So little black boys and little white boys and little black girls and little white girls walking hand in hand don't mean daily squat on a pot. So I've never been one to, to look at proximity or the presence of white people or the absence of white people to be neither here nor there. When I sat in my all-black school, living in my all-black neighborhood, coming up, I never felt as though being surrounded by black folks, having all-black teachers in all-black schools, and everywhere I look, everywhere I throw a rock, I hit a black person. I never felt, that, oh, that's segregation. I never felt that that was inherently oppressive, discriminatory, or ever a negative thing. That's me. Now, what I do feel was oppressive was external forces having power, influence, control, corrupting uh, policies in my community. If they left us the hell alone. But I digress. It wasn't incentive. But when I moved to this city, 
The fact that it was one of the most segregated cities in America and that black folks and little black boys didn't have an opportunity to walk hand in hand with little white boys, that wasn't a no sell for me. So, you know, yeah, I have two sons. Neither one of them have ever had the opportunity to walk hand in hand with little white boys. And I think that their childhood is not any less fulfilling because of it. So I have no problem with that. But anyway, when I moved to Chicago, I was told that I was moving to the most segregated metropolis in all of America. I said, so be it. So it kind of surprised me to hear, you know, someone I respect, you know, from what I know about his journalism, what I know about his political analysis, and how deep his roots run in Chicago politics. I was somewhat surprised that someone like Dick Kay would say, this is the most tribalistic election Chicago has ever had. It's kind of, I thought maybe it's like when white folks say Bernie is the worst president ever. I don't get offended. I don't get hurt when people say this is the Bernie, I mean, did I say Bernie? Freudian. I'm getting Freudian up in here. When Trump is the worst president ever. And then black people are like, oh, what about the slave owning presidents? And y'all going to force white people to say, oh, I'm sorry. When I talk about my issues, my interest, my agenda, I'm not thinking about you. You're going to force me to say, hey, can we just have this background uh, neglect, this benign neglect? You're going to force me to have to say it? That's more of the integrationist. Let white folks get in their huddle and cry about Trump. And you're trying to squeeze in white folks' huddle, anti-Trump huddle. Just wait your turn. I'm sure they'll do the integrationist huddle and the black huddle. There's several huddles. When it's the white huddle, when white folks are white, I'm sorry, worse for us. The slave owning presidents weren't so bad for us, I suppose. But I went and looked it up because I'm like, this can't possibly be. But it was actually the most tribal election and not my quote. But this was the most tribal election in Chicago history. But it's not tribal because people are divided, weeping and wailing and moaning. The people, the electorate is so divided. The electorate is actually not divided. Americans are not divided. This is not the most divided time people are so at arms. That's not true. That is a lie. But we got to stop looking at the surface. Yeah, we got Tea Party and the NAACP still, you know, trying to find a uh, squeeze blood justice out of this uh, racist turn up. But the reason it's the most tribal election is for the first time in Chicago electoral, mayoral electoral history, everybody had a representative candidate, almost everybody, but just about everybody. So in the past, black folks couldn't be tribal because nine, 99 times out of 10, there was no black candidate. But this election, you had Mendoza, and in another Latino candidate, you had an Irish candidate and somebody to represent the polls, and you had a black candidate, you had a South Side black candidate, then you had a uppity Bronzeville Hyde Park candidate. So everybody had their own candidate. In the past, there would be one or two candidates. So you didn't get to vote your specific ethnicity. So this was tribal because Mendoza took the West Side, Latinos. Uh, Prep Winkle and Willie Wilson took the South Side, the hood, the community, my hood. Uh, Lori Lightfoot, because, you know, she she's she's transracial like Obama. So she took the Lake Shore on up towards the Gold Coast. Daly, of course, and the other, you know, generic white males took the North Side. So it was, I actually, he was right. It was an extremely tribal election. Everybody got behind the candidate that not reflected their values, but reflected their skin tone, that reflected their ethnicity. What do you know? We thought we're so sophisticated. We got these micro processing computers in our back pocket. We all have all this forward thinking. We have all this terminology, you know, we all, have this social justice terminology and, and, and political correctness, and I'm the, probably the only person in the world that's not, and I am pro-political correctness. I support political correctness. So I'm not downing it. I'm just saying. We ask people what their uh, preferred pronouns are. 
We got handicap, handicap ramps and things for, we're just so enlightened. But when it comes down to it, we got our shields, our spears, and we dance around our own fire. And if anybody from the next tribe over tries to dance around our fire, we get real hostile. It's, it's I don't know. I don't care, really. But yeah, it's it, 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 this was the most tribal election. Now everybody has to regroup and reorient itself and figure out whether it's going to be Lori Lightfoot and uh, or uh, or uh, Prep Winkle. And let me just come out the gate and say I support for the next mayor of Chicago, nobody. Because nobody won the election. Nobody won. Nobody got 70% of the, uh, 73%, I believe, of, of the, uh, the registered voters. Only 30% voted. 32% of the registered voters voted. So the majority of people voted for nobody. So nobody should be mayor. I don't know what nobody's platform is. I don't know who nobody will appoint. I'm not sure what nobody's position on police brutality, infrastructure, taxation, the, the, the pension crisis that's facing this city. What nobody plans to do about the historic racism that has driven South Chicago to become Chirac a violent, dysfunctional, throwaway zone with dilapidated schools. I don't know what nobody plans to do, but nobody should be mayor because nobody ran. I think I'm going to, the next election, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to change my name to nobody and run as nobody because every election cycle, nobody gets the majority. Maybe I could run that hustle. And I'll either be in office or be in prison, but we'll see. I'll be in federal prison. I'll share a, 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 a cell with Donald Trump, you know, and shake him down for commissary. We both be dirty politicians that tried to scam America. <laughs> anyway, that's who I truly think should be. But out of the two, since since this is not a just democracy, where this is not a true democracy because... The, the nobody gets the majority and majority rules, so nobody should rule. Anarchy, I guess. On the on based on the two candidates, Lori Lightfoot and Tony Prepwinkle, I'm going to vote for Tony Prepwinkle. I'm going to consciously, deliberately, and happily vote against Lori Lightfoot. Lori Lightfoot is the police. And I just can't bring myself to vote for a pro-police candidate. And Tony Prepwinkle is a representative of the Democratic machine. But for all intents and purposes, that machine is greatly vulnerable and greatly weakened. And I believe the people, if we mobilize ourselves properly, I believe that Tony Prepwinkle will be much more vulnerable to black demands and much more likely to capitulate to black interest because of her vulnerability to the black community, because of her dependency in order to win on the black community, if we properly lobby, if we properly sanction, if we properly maneuver under a Prep Winkle candidacy, I believe that we could get more politically out of Prep Winkle administration than we ever could out of a Lori Lightfoot administration because Lori Lightfoot is insulated from black demands and from any sanctions from the black community because of her level of white support. She doesn't really need us. We could sit at home. If all black folks sit, sat at home, Lori Lightfoot would win because she is the preordained white candidate. So Chinatown, the North Side, that's, that's just what it is. And they are already, since they couldn't divide, they had the racial divide, the Latina, the white, the black candidates. Since that's all gone and two black women got up there and two black women gonna gonna go into the, the, the final stretch of the race for mayor of Chicago, regardless of who wins, it will be in a historic election. They couldn't just let that slide. They couldn't just, you know, do the Holy Ghost dance. They couldn't just say, We got two black umans that he'll gonna be mayor of the third largest city in America. Historic. No, 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 that's not enough. You gotta, you gotta dig it, you gotta stab, you gotta pick out a festering wound, you gotta stir up some mess, and where there is no controversy, 
no controversy. That's how we educated people say controversy. When there is no controversy, they make some. So the Chicago Sun Times, which I hate, if you must read a paper, read the Chicago Tribune. I ain't saying that it's better. It's just less worse. Read the Chicago Tribune. Do not read the Chicago Sun Times. And if you must read garbage, do like I do. Go read the articles free online. But they went to Chicago Sun Times, went and got these two black women to do an article about two black women that are running for office. This historical election. And so what did these two black women who were tasked with putting together this article about two other historical black women, what did they want to talk about? Their agenda for black women? No. Their progressive policies? No. Their grand academic achievements? No. Their political history? No. Their platform? No. These two black women decided in their article about these two black women to write an article entitled, Two Black Women Running for Mayor? Question mark. For some black men, that's a nightmare. Let me read that article again. Chicago sometime, 3-3-2019. Two black women running for mayor, you say? For some black men, some, I don't know any of these black men, that's a nightmare. And then they talk about, this is written by Lori Washington. Laura Washington. But she interviewed this other uh, sister, Every sister ain't a sister, man. But she went and uh, this woman, um, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce I should have looked up the pronounce. But this other sister, this AKA, she's a Greek. So I ain't calling her a sister. This, this wannabe colonizer, she wants to be a Greek. She's a uh, name uh, Egon Manwa. Egon Manwa. They, they, Laura and Iguamang, uh, man, I, I should have looked up the proper pronounce because I, let's just call her by her, her, her Christian name, Kimberly. Kimberly and Laura, two black women, should have known, named Kimberly and Laura, went and said that two black women running for office and having a black woman mayor was a nightmare for some black men. And what evidence did they give? They said, well, Bobby Rush, who most black men don't support, <clears throat> Bobby, the agent Rush, endorsed Daly. And I remember when Bobby Rush endorsed Daly. Every black man I knew that was engaged in the freaking, uh, that was engaged in the um, political race. And I was working on one of the, the candidates, uh, re a state representative for, through his hat in the race to run for mayor. And I worked on his campaign. And we were talking to many of the other campaign people, you know, and I couldn't go to Whole Foods without having to have a stop and chats with some other people trying to find out what we're doing on the campaign, how things are looking, and I talked to them about their candidates. But when, when Bobby Rush came out, every black male I knew that was engaged in the politics, when he came out and endorsed daily for mayor, Every black man was outraged and couldn't believe it, utterly flabbergasted. And even some people were talking about, we got to run somebody against Bobby. We got to get Bobby out of there. I don't think he should have ever got in there. But I, I didn't meet one black male on the street in the community. So when Bobby Rush endorsed Daly, he did not do so on behalf of the black community. He did not do so on behalf of black men. He endorsed Daly because Daly Race is a big time fundraiser. Daly worked in Obama's cabinet and Bobby Rush did so to feed his own political ambition. He did not do so as a representative of black men. He did not do it because he was trying to represent the interests of black men. He's been in office for decades and ain't done nothing to represent the interests of black men. So I guess he's one black man. And then they talked about how Willie Wilson ran as if black men simply engaging in the political process and running against black female opponents is somehow anti-black woman, even though these two black women stomped these fools out. All the black men got stomped out by, and I didn't hear any tearing down. I don't know where this came for black men, for some black men. And then they just have all this anti-dotal, non-sequiturs uh, uh, non in, in the article. It was utterly absurd, the, one of the most absurd articles. But now they want to try to play this 
that black men are against Prep Winkle. Now, and there are black men against Prep Winkle and black men against Lori Lightfoot. And every single black man I know that is against Lori Lightfoot and or Prep Winkle has nobody said because they're a woman. In fact, if you look at Amara Inya's campaign, it was all black men. So obviously black men were willing to, and, and, and somebody said to my wife one time, this white feminist came to my wife and said, America, people didn't want to vote for Hillary because she's a woman and nobody wants a woman to be president. And my wife said, I would never vote for Clinton. She could talk, talk about Haiti, super predators, you know, more than doubling the, the, the uh, prison industrial complex. Uh, I mean, just I'm not going to get into the Clinton's crimes because that will take up the rest of the show. And she was like, oh, you're and she tried to tell my wife that she was unconsciously oppressed. She basically, you know, used white women terminology to say that she was a pick me or something. And my wife said, I did vote for a woman president. She's like, no, you didn't. You didn't vote for Hillary. So you, you don't want a woman to be president. She said, I voted for Jill Stein. And the woman just stared. Like, what? So you don't even acknowledge the other women. Like, if it ain't my woman, there's no woman. That's how feminists do. There's, a, there's only one kind of woman. Woman to woman. It's like, if it ain't my woman, then you ain't a woman. They, 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 they basically discount the humanity and femininity of all other women. It's, it's a mess. But I digress. So this is how they're going to play it. They're going to get these, these hacks, Kimberly, Laura, and there's plenty of other hacks. So now they're going to try to play it black man versus black woman. That's how they're going to set it up. And like I said, every brother that had objections to Lori was like, she's the police. She, she had black protesters who were fighting for justice arrested. Her, and she's a longtime political insider. And you want to talk about Bobby Rush? Uh, endorsing daily. Do we need to talk about Pro Prep Winkle and her cozy relationship with several of her pernicious white politicians? Which I'm forgiving her because, like I said, I'm voting for Prep Winkle. Even though I think nobody should be mayor, I'm going to vote for Prep Winkle because I, Lori Lightfoot, like, for, I gave my reasons. And I'll say it again if I have to. But moving on. So we, we tribalize. We're tribalized. With all this sophisticated technology, with all this book learning, with all our politeness and niceties, we're still a bunch of tribe, tribesmen in our little fiefdoms, banging it out, set tripping. Also, uh, the, 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 the Democrats in Congress want to shoot themselves in their own foot. They want to formally censure Elon Omar for her anti-Semitism, even though they're going to move forward with trying to censure Elon Omar, freshman uh, Dem uh, Democratic Congresswoman, from Detroit, the hijab congresswoman, the first congresswoman to wear a hijab, made some accurate, honest, and deliberate remarks about the nation of Israel and its genocidal uh, imperialist policies. It's constant, even, even, they're moving forward with this, even though just this Monday, the beginning of this week, a UN investigative panel has found that Israel is not only guilty of war crimes, they want all signatory nations to say if if it's an Israeli official, if a high-ranking Israeli military or political official comes into your country, you are obligated to arrest them and hand them over to the International Criminal Court. Israel shot peaceful, unarmed protesters, children, disabled people, elderly people who were unarmed fighting for their uh, uh, human rights. And the right of return, the march of, great march of return, Israel set about slaughtering, illegally massacre, massacring Palestinians in their own territory. Right? And so, even as that came out, you still have U.S. politicians who said that Elon Omar is an anti-Semite, and we can't have anti Now, we can have pedophiles ran for Congress. We got avert racist, sexist in Congress. You can have almost anything. You can have cannibalistic killer clowns in Congress. But one thing Congress will not tolerate is anti-Semitism. Oh, I'm sorry. There are anti-Semitics -Sem uh, in uh, Congress. There are many anti-Semitic congressmen. What you can't have is an anti-imperialist congressman or congresswoman. 
because she didn't really speak against Jews. She spoke against imperialism. You can't have anti-racist. You can't have anti-genocide. Even though all these prominent Jewish scholars and Jewish organizations, Jewish Voices for Peace, Norman Finkelstein, can you get more Jewish than Norman Finkelstein, whose uh, family members died in the gas chambers in Krakow? Norman Finkelstein, Noam Chomsky, of course, he's Jewish, right? Perhaps the most well-read, well-respected, most celebrated Jewish scholar since Albert Einstein. They all came out and said, not only is she not anti-Semitic, she's fully accurate in her assessment of Israel and the undue influence that APAC has over the U.S. Uh, political system. But Congress women, the congressional, the coon congressional, coon emphasized, coon congressional black Congress, all leading Democrats, the two head, uh, uh, what, um, Nancy Pelosi, and who's, who's the Senate minority uh, head? He's Jewish, too. Um, his name just escapes me right now. But anyway, all the Jewish leadership, the Democratic Leadership Congress, and the DNC, I suppose. I'm not sure what the DNC, but I'm pretty sure by the time all these other money generating uh, Democrats said the DNC is going to have to go with the flow, are going to censure, formally censure uh, uh, Representative Omar for her quote unquote anti Semitism, which is utterly disgusting. This is utterly absurd. But it should inform the voting public who they really represent. Who they really represent. Because Obama was a dyed in the wool Zionist. Obama, when Obama was elected to office in 2008, Israel embarked on Operation Cast Lead and went about an orgy of mass murder of Palestinians just to show they could do it. And Obama got on the camera and said, um, I, um, I respect Israel's right to defend itself. And I knew right at that moment, it's going to be a bumpy eight years, four to eight years. I knew right then this man is going to be an utter catastrophe for black folks. I knew when he said those words, I'm like, it's done. I'll never vote for this man. We're moving on. Oh, today is a uh, celebratory day. Today is the day that uh, Christmas addicts got killed on fighting for white folks' rights, for whatever that's worth for you. Mar oh, yesterday was. I'm sorry. Yesterday. But I, I didn't have a show yesterday, so I couldn't shout him out yesterday. Shouting out Christmas addicts, the first black man to ever cape so hard for white folks. He died uh, March 5th, 1770, just six years before the, the uh, liberation of America. <laughs> it's funny. I can't say those words without laughing. The liberation of America, <laughs> you know. And they were fighting for the same things, Trump is hooping and all the taxes, tariffs, wah, wah, wah. Whatever that means to you, however you want to commemorate it, you want to go lay out on the ground and let white folks walk over you. I don't know how we would recognize the, the, the triumphant martyrdom of crispy uh, addicts. <clears throat> crispy addicts. And also, remember if you go back and listen to uh, Monday show and Friday show, I told y'all not to mess with them children at that daycare center. I'm not even going to say the name of the daycare center. I don't even want to say the name of the woman at this point. But the woman who bailed R. Kelly out of jail, people called in bomb threats at the child care center that she owns, where she makes her money to bail out pedophiles. And I just don't think that's the way to go. Now, let me say this also, tinfoil hat time, real quick. I wouldn't put it past this woman because she was getting a lot of flack. Everybody went on social media and other platforms on the Internet and dumped her ratings for her restaurant. She was being called out every which way, left, right, and up, and down. And she was getting universal hatred and, and, and denunciation. And uh, I wouldn't put it past her to... to, to, to calling the bomb threat herself, because she's that despicable of a person. I don't know, but it, either way, I, I just said that we should not allow these children at this daycare center and these working parents who have to put their kids in that despicable woman's daycare center to be caught in the crossfire. I said, only she has a restaurant. You can go protest and, and go and let your, you know, do your dine dash, whatever form of protest you want. But I said, leave the babies out of it. Don't let them get caught in the crossfire. It's bad enough they have to go to a daycare center owned by a pro-pedophile uh, capitalist black woman. But 
you know, nobody listens to Bro Diallo. So there's a legit, alleged bomb threat. There has been no suspects named. So we don't know who did it. It could have been someone trying to drum up sympathy for the victim. The pro, I, I don't even, I don't even like calling her a victim, but the drum up sympathy. Who knows? I don't know the story behind it. But like I said, it, you know, you're not doing justice for R. Kelly's victims by creating more uh, victims, by victimizing other people. So there are enough opportunities and creative ways to 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 oppose R. Kelly and all that. So, um, but anyway, that's that's bad news. Uh, we we do have some good news. And I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what you're doing right now. Let me tell you something. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, stop right now and listen to the voice. Cause listen to my voice. Tune in to my frequency right now, brothers and sisters. Because what I am about to tell you needs your full, undivided, un undis undisrupted attention. I'm sorry. And I know sometimes I go a little too far with this. Sometimes I praise a little too hard. I celebrate a little too strong. I wrap myself a little too tightly in the glory. I know I'm guilty. But sometimes we need that, y'all. Because sometimes the glory, sometimes the power, sometimes the Holy Spirit is so powerful that it'll bring down its glory. And every now and then, when you have your doubts, when you have your times of weakness, the Lord will send a sign. The Lord will send you evidence of his greatness, of his existence. And what am I talking about? What is this current evidence? I know you're waiting and you want to hear and I'm going to tell you. As of yesterday, Hillary Rodham Clinton announced that she will not be running for president. sweaty. That's right. Hillary Rodden Clinton will not be running for... Oh, glory! Glory! All right, cut. Cut. All right. Rotten Clinton announced that she will not. Oh, 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 All right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get fired. Hillary Rodden Clinton announced that she will not be seeking the presidency for the 2020 general election cycle. Look at God. Now he didn't turn over or stop one slave ship. No, he didn't. He didn't end the Holocaust. No, he didn't. He let us sit on them damn plantation for 230 years. Yes, he did. He let them Jim Crow and leech. Yes, he did it. He did it. He didn't help your auntie with her, her sugar diabetes. No, he didn't. He didn't help your uncle with his heart failure. No, he didn't. But one thing he did done do, Lord, he 
touched that wicked little woman's heart and said, not this year. Give the people a break. So for the first time in such a long time, for the first time since 1992, since 1992, for the first time, we will have a Clinton-free election. And I'm counting, because remember, after Bill left office, 92, in the year 2000, Clinton ran for Senate. And after Clinton ran for Senate, then Obama reemerged. He emerged his ugly head, and he brought in the Clinton. And not only that, if you look at Obama's administration, he handpicked all of his top-level cabinet officials were former Clinton. So Obama was the third term and the uh, fourth term of Bill Clinton. He was nothing but a Clinton clone. So you don't know how long we've been under the political plague of the Clinton crime family. I ain't saying it's the only one. I'm not even saying it's the worst one. The worst thing about the Clintons is not the fact that it's another criminal, corrupt political dynasties. Those always come up in American politics. But what I'm saying is the one political, criminal, political dynasty that black folks for some reason couldn't see through. That black folks, generally, we always knew, even if you were not a political black person, oh, they ain't for us or whatever. They going to do what they going to do. But Bill Clinton playing that saxophone on Arsenio Hall's show and Tony Morrison, shame on you, talking about Bill Clinton was the first black president because he ate McDonald's and was raised by a single mother. Yeah, she said it. Look it up. For some reason, black people just can't see through the Clinton fog. Just couldn't. Even Obama did the dance in the jig for Hillary after Hillary disrespected him and they even prayed for and contemplated his assassination on the campaign trail. He brought in and gave her one of the most powerful positions in his entire administration. And she still disrespected and dumped on him the whole time, even though he gave her a job and paid off her campaign debt. So this is the first election cycle, and I don't care if Trump get back in. I don't care if y'all get one of these generic white Democrats in. I don't care what happens. One thing we know for sure that has no potential of ever happening is that we ain't got to suffer another Clinton getting up, talking that slick Arkansas draw. Hillary Clinton is a racist, has always been a racist, but she, she's the worst kind of racist. She's a pandering racist. Smiling in your face all the time they want to take your place. Backstabbing racists. Give me an overt, open, honest racist over a slithering, backstabbing, I love you, let me put some hot sauce in my purse, lying ass, fake, plant, pretending like they cool with us racists. So, Hillary Clinton says she ain't running. But don't, we ain't out of the woods yet. We might have another four to eight years of Clinton free, but you know Chelsea with her old ugly self. Yeah, I said it, she ugly. You don't lock up my people and expect me to be civil. Old ugly Chelsea and the Zionist she married. What's with these wealthy white Anglo-Saxon Protestants marrying off their children to Orthodox Zionist? What's up with that? Well, ugly Chelsea said that she has found her calling. And she got tired of ripping off her parents' charity, stealing money from Haiti, raising money in the name of Haitian relief and stealing it. She got tired of doing that. So now Chelsea is contemplating throwing her hat into the political arena. So hopefully, I don't know where that old ugly girl lived, but hopefully maybe she'll do city council, maybe mayor, maybe state legislature. But eventually she's going to be in Congress or the Senate and eventually Chelsea is going to run for president. So we ain't Clinton free yet. I'm Clinton free. In the day, old Bill Clinton's gone. He's gone away. So we Clinton free for this cycle. So just relax for a minute. Take a minute. Kick your shoes off. Put your feet up. We Clinton free for this election cycle. So you ain't got to listen to your dumbass aunties and uncles. Some of y'all dumbass mamas and daddies. Some of these dumbass old black people, for some reason, got Clinton phobia. Clinton, I mean, Clinton philia. I don't know how many black people, oh, Clinton was good to, uh. I don't know where, when, how, why. I don't know. So maybe, just maybe, I can, I don't even try. I mean, we're going to have a Clinton free, uh, but you know, they still run the Democratic leadership council. The Clintons still run the, the, the purse strings. 
of the Democrat. They they are the conduit for corporate money, neoliberal corporate money. Into the, so they, they ain't that they won't have any influence, but they at least have to go behind the curtain. And we don't have to look at their ugly faces. Bill Clinton, ugly. Hillary Clinton, ugly. Chelsea and Clinton, double ugly, because she come from too ugly. That's right. You can't lock up my people. I ain't being civil. Some ugly people. Y'all need to go on back to Arkansas and untangle your, ge your, 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 your gene pool. Drain your gene pool. It looks a little too thick, too shallow. I'm done. Done talking about the Clintons. And I don't have to talk about the Clintons for a hot minute, because like I said, by the time another Clinton's running for office, I'm sure I'll be off the air because y'all don't give me the necessary support, but that's another d discussion. Let's talk about something else. Get my pressure back down. Haiti. Yeah, I did mention Haiti. Haiti's in flames. Like, seriously. Haiti the Liberté. Maybe this Haitian issue needs a lot more discussion. So maybe I, I will come back to that if we have time. If not, we'll pick it up Friday. But there's some angle to this Haitian and U.S. imperialism that, that black people, that directly impacts black Americans. Some of y'all DOS scumbags, they're like, if it don't impact me directly, my pockets, because you're inhumane, you're non-empathetic, your isolation is tribal. But moving on. Uh, one more thing before we go on to the topic of the day, and the topic of the day is a black agenda. We got time. We're doing okay on time. I might even be able to get back to this Haitian issue. I want to do it justice. <sighs> Alabama had a tornado. Not a tornado. Tornado. Alabama had a tornado. And uh, before the wind stopped blowing, before the cows fell out of the sky, they was already at the government teat trying to suckle. And Trump made a proclamation. He admonished his team to say that he wants Alabama to get what he called, I quote, A plus treatment from the government. And some people, like myself, were like, what the hell is A plus treatment from the government? And if they're getting A plus and you have to specifically uh, demand that Alabama gets the A plus treatment, what, what Houston get? What, what Puerto Rico get? What are all the other disaster areas? What are California and, and besieged by wildfires? What do they get? How would you rate there? So anyway, Trump is like, that's where my inbred toothless voters are. Alabama is Trump country. And not only is Alabama Trump country, it's a, it's a Republican stronghold. And Republican policy is no government handouts. That government can't do anything right. That we need to turn everything over to private industry that having strong Christian values, having a strong work ethic is enough to rescue you from any situation. And every single time one of these backwater states gets in trouble, one of these red states, one of these Republican anti-government, uh, no taxation uh, states get into trouble, they come begging, crawling, and groveling for government bailout. Every single time, it never fails. I've never seen, remember when Obama was like, here's some government subsidies, and they were like, we don't take handouts. We don't want your dirty government money. And then here come a tornado. And remember, when the wildfires come and burn up California, and when, when, when the earth came to Haiti, when the hurricane came to uh, Puerto Rico, you had all of these Christian evangelical prophets, these child molesters in the Christian white evangelical church. They come out and say that that's God, that God was punishing Haitians for making a deal with the devil to get free and, and practicing heathenistic African religions. They said that California is ablaze because of uh, the fornicating and the homosexuality. Remember Puerto Rico. They not white, they're not Christian properly, Santeria and all that mumbo jumbo. But every time a red state gets biblical storms, they had like 500 tornadoes all in one day. The highest winds gust ever recorded, the most powerful tornadoes on record hit Alabama. And I ain't heard one of these Christians and evangelicals talk about how it was God's wrath. Hypocritical. SOBs, man, I swear. 
I swear. But anyway, so don't pray for Alabama. Alabama should be praying for us. They more godly than us. They're whiter and more righteous than us. So don't pray for Alabama. And I say, every red state, every anti-taxation state, don't tax them. And another thing about all these red anti-tax states, they always receive more federal revenue than they feed into. The metropolis, like the blue New York, blue Democratic Chicago, purplish Houston, uh, blue California, blue Colorado, send way more uh, money to the federal government than they ever receive because the blue states are more productive. And then the, the, the red states are the welfare states. All the Mississippi welfare whore, that whole state, welfare queen. Alabama, of course, Arkansas. <laughs> you know, the only red state that's probably not a, 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 a welfare queen is probably, uh, what, Florida and, and, and Texas, but they have their own issues. Anyway, just the hypocrisy upon hypocrisy. But, I mean, this nation was founded on the greatest hypocrisy ever. Slave-owning uh, uh, genocidal murderers talking about land of the free home, you know, freedom and, 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 and man created equal. So, no point stopping. I mean, uh, hypocrisy has brought America this far. The only superpower, the wealthiest superpower in the world. I guess there's no point in stopping the hypocrisy at this point. Now let's get to the topic at hand. We've had enough fun and we've gone through enough misery. Let's talk about the topic at hand. Today's show is entitled A Black Agenda, Construction and Implementation. And the reason I'm talking is because, you know, every now and then black people, the hood, the streets, the community will get on a kick where everybody starts to talk about the same issue. And even though some people bring their own slant to the issue, it's just a trending issue. And things like this really pop up, things like this really pop up during election cycles. So now the buzzword of election cycle is black agenda. And people feel so sophisticated and full of themselves when they get to go to politicians of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party or the Libertarian Party and say, what is your black agenda? <laughs> Look how enlightened I am. Look how cold-blooded I'm being. Because I went to a politician and I said, what is your black agenda? And we feel so proud of ourselves going to these crackers asking what their black agenda is. And what's scary and what we don't realize as black people, because a lot of black and there are a lot of prominent black figures who are now running around the country in this current election cycle talking about we need a black agenda. What is the black agenda? Blah, 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 black agenda. And what's really freaking stupid about that is that the United States has had a specific unbroken public black agenda since the 1700s. And so we're going to political politicians within a political system asking them what is their black agenda when we already are. You are a product of the black agenda, dummy. You are a byproduct of the black agenda. You don't go to a politician to say what the black agenda is. Get your ass on King Drive and drive south, do south. Start at Roosevelt, which is the dividing line, black and white. Get it, start at Roosevelt on State and Roosevelt, Michigan and Roosevelt, whatever street you want, and head due south. And you will see what the black agenda is. I'm not sure. That's like a Jew going to Hitler as he's trying to become chancellor and supreme leader of, 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 of Nazi Germany, and you say, Hitler, Goebbels, what is your black agenda? I mean, what is your Jewish agenda? That's like the, the antelope going to the lion saying, lion, what is your antelope agenda? Why the hell am I looking at the TV and I'm seeing black people sit across from Bernie Sanders talking about, Bernie, what's your black agenda? What? Now, I don't think y'all understand what agenda is. I just think it's a 
And I'm just sick of hearing the word. Y'all just sully the word. Y'all have sullied the word and y'all have warped the concept. Let me tell you something for all you black people running around asking democratic politicians and some of y'all are even so stupid. Like that black dude, that gun rights black dude that went to APAC to talk about black gun rights. You go through a bunch of Nazis talking about black gun rights. But I digress. I think it's so stupid that y'all running up to these people talking about the black agenda. What's, what, what's in it for black people? What black people gonna get? Black, 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 black. Now, the only reason you would have to ask that question is because you're willfully ignorant of the answer because the answer is apparent. We know what the black, over 20 years ago, Dr. Claude Anderson said, the agenda for black people has not changed since the first black person came here in the hull of a slave ship. The agenda has been the same and has never changed. He said, and I paraphrase, but quote, black people were brought to this country to be a non-competitive, subordinate, undercompensated class of people that exists for the, the enrichment, entertainment, and comfort of white people. And everything whites have done, whether it has do Jim Crow laws or civil rights legislation and reforms, everything the white majority has done has been to sustain that status quo. Every politician, the reason the police, the electoral system, everything exists to sustain and to feed the status quo. And so once you know that, then you have to say, what is black people's position within the status quo and our role within the status quo? But you'd rather play dumb because when the answer is there, when you already have the answer, then that puts the onus back on black people to say, hey, we got to do something about this. But we, when we could pretend to be ignorant, we can look at Bernie Sanders or, or, or look at uh, um, Hil the Clintons or look at Elizabeth Warren, or even go to Cory Booger and Kamala lock him up and throw away the key Harris and say, what do you have for black people? What do you have in store for black folks? So I'm like, well, I guess we have to, even though Ford with the black, we even have a, a wonderful sh uh, website, Black Agenda Report. Now they ain't always, I mean, I've had my issues. If you go look at the Bro Diallo archives, I've had my issues with some of their analysis and the positions they take. But overall, you should go. If you want to know what the, I'm, I can't curse. But if you want to know what the black agenda is, the fact that you have to ask anybody but yourself what the black agenda is means you got to check, chickity check yourself. So let's talk about specifically. Now that we've pretty much pointed out that how we go about discussing this black agenda is all wrong. I'm proud that we're back to talking about agendas. We're no longer talking about what's right and what's wrong. What's just and unjust. And now we're being more mature about it. This is all about agendas and competing agendas and counter agendas. So when you come to the stage, you understand people aren't going to do stuff because it's right. And they're not going to refrain from engaging in activities because it's wrong. It's about power. Or as uh, Mitch McConnell said, raw power politics. I love that phraseology. Raw power politics. That's all America is about. Ain't no good, ain't no bad, ain't no villains, ain't no heroes. It's winners and losers. So you have to define what will it take to win? And do I have the will and capacity to do what it takes to win? And having the capacity, having the resources, having the know-how ain't the same as having the will. And having the will ain't the same as having. You got to bring those two together. You need the capacity and the will. So, what should be the black agenda? Or what is the black agenda? There are some black agendas. There is a black agenda that I wholly reject. And the basic black agenda, the ongoing black agenda, since Garvey was subverted by W.E.B. Du Bois, 
because the original black agenda, the true independent black agenda was for Africans in America to unite with all Africans of the African diaspora and make political, economic, geopolitical, military ties, social and cultural ties with the African continent, to reconnect with our home continent and have the same relationship as Africans in America have with Africa as Europeans in America have with Europe and form trade blocks, form mutual defense pact to have conduits of educational exchange students. So Garvey did not want to take all black people back to Africa. Garvey wanted to take black people back to Africa to bring our first world know-how to the African continent to industrialize and build up the African continent so that Africa could be both a competitor and a stopgap to Western imperialism. And that way that Africa could provide direct aid and support to Africans all over the world. And Africans all over the world would lend their support and skills to Africa. He said Africa for Africans at home and abroad. Africa for Africans at home and abroad. And he understood if Africa is not free and powerful, then no African or outside of Africa will be free and powerful. When you look at a, any migrant or transplanted population, they are only as strong as their homeland. And that's why every time there was any type of political turmoil in Europe, even including two world wars, United States, they put on their combat boots and took, put on their helmets and went across the Atlantic and jumped in the fight. And to this day, UK, Germany, France, to a lesser extent, Spain, Portugal, Western Europe, and the United States have always maintained strong cultural, political, even though they hate each other. Remember when they got into a fight, Freedom Fries, they stopped calling French fries, French fries, they called it Freedom Fries because France wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go lockstep with uh, Bush's invasion of Iraq, even though they were hanging, calling each other's name, even though they spy on each other, they know white, we are the white world. And our entire, just like me and my wife fight, me and my wife could be having the worst argument we've ever had in our home, but let some outsider kick in our door. Both of us are gonna forget whatever the hell we fight now and beat the hell out of the whoever kicked in our door. So don't think just because uh, a family members are having an internal argument that you think one of them are on your side and one of them will fight for you harder than they'll fight against the person they're fighting against. And so Garvey wanted to create a pan-African uh, interdependent symbiotic relationship between Africans at home and abroad. That was the original black agenda. But W.E.B. Du Bois, who was propped up by white interest, he was the very first official, well, not, let me not say that. The agenda before that, because remember, you had the African Back to Africa movement was here before Garvey. And even some of our ancestors made it back to Africa and Liberia. It was disastrous because it was not a revolutionary effort. Everything black people do must be revolutionary. We can't just open businesses. We need revolutionary business. We can't just get married. We need revolutionary marriage. We can't just rear and educate children. We need every revolutionary child rearing and education. When you are oppressed, everything you do must feed into revolution. You don't have the luxury, the comfort, or the privilege of simply just being. You can't just be, my name is Michelle. You must be revolutionary, Michelle. I can't just be Diallo. I must be revolutionary, Diallo. If I fail to be revolutionary, Diallo, and I just go about being Diallo, I am a cog in the machine. I am sustaining and legitimizing the status quo. And the status quo is the status quo that does not recognize my humanity and intends to oppress me as it oppressed my ancestors and intends to oppress all of my descendants. But I digress. Now, you had a competing agendas. Back in the day, you had Booker T. Washington, who was somewhat of an integrationist. He was an amalgam of Garvey and Dubois. He said we should navigate and capitulate to the standing system and use whatever resources or whatever openings the standings. He had the whole cast down your bucket where you stand. 
Don't fight with these crazy crackers. Don't argue with these crazy crackers. Don't even go against these crazy crackers. Just identify openings within the crazy cracker system. You get in, you lock yourself in in that system, and you build up from where you are. You know, so you have to travel the road that the oppressor paved before you, but you can determine the, 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 the pace or the speed which you travel down that road. It didn't make much sense. But you remember, W.E.B. Du Bois is one who financed, who brought us Garvey. If there was no, not W.E.B. Du Bois, if, no, if there was no Booker T. Washington, there would be no Marcus Garvey. Go look it up. Go look at who, who Garvey sent du Bo uh, Booker T. a letter. Booker T. Uh, sponsored his coming to America. And unfortunately, before they could, before Garvey could bring his Pan-African vision and marry that to Booker T.'s industrialism, which would have been cold, which would have been wonderful, transformative. The world would be a different place. Booker T died. So Garvey kind of came here, even though he, he still, you know, wanted to come here um, because of the industrial might and the influence that America was building, the United States. Booker T wasn't alive by the time he was able to get here, even though they was in, were in communication, in positive communication. So anyway... We were having this tug of war. Should we charge our own path or should we just become America's and melt an American melting pot, integrate into America? But that was somewhat of an independent debate. And the reason it was an independent debate is because white people, number one, they had their own issues. At that same time, there was World War I. They were just coming out of another depression. And there were also a lot of other white people coming to America at this time. And these white people were not just standard Anglo-Saxon Protestant. They had Catholics, and white folks didn't trust and hate Catholics. They had Jews, white folks didn't trust and hate Jews. They had Southern Europeans, Italians, Greeks, and other non-English speaking white folks coming to America, and they all hate each other. And, and if we really study, we should really study white ethnic conflict, white ethnic strife, and, and white disunity. But we like to, we just don't like to get academic with our resistance. We just, but I, I, I progress. Let's keep it moving. So white folks were basically like, black people are subhuman, black people are inferior, and we pretty much can just, they are what they are. They're they going to share crop, they're going to make grain whiskey, and they're going to make some good music for us. But other than that, they're a non-factor. And even at the time when J. Edgar Hoover was rising in the rank of the OSS and later the FBI, he was focusing on the real threat in America was not black militants, but white anarchist, white communist. And so anyway, black people were able to independently make a decision of what we wanted to do. And hands down, without any shadow of a doubt, black people chose Pan-Africanism. They chose Garvey and the Back to Africa movement. They rejected both Booker T. Washington and later W.E.B. Du Bois. They rejected the cast down your, your pail where you stand, and they rejected, no, we could all be uh, scholarly white men, and we could all fully integrate into the white man's system. Black people, by the millions, said, we're going to go with Garvey. And Garvey got all this going before J. Edgar Hoover could look up and was like, damn, what the hell? UNIA had a, little, a small window of time to, to develop. And literally, the largest black organization in the history of the United States, past, present, and future. Nobody has reached Garvey's level. And we, the biggest, most well-supported, hunt to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars. And the people who built up Garvey's organization, these weren't black lawyers. They weren't like Dr. Umar, black PhDs. These were illiterate and semi-literate sharecroppers. And black people would scrape and save for two, three years to get a little, to buy a, a share in the Black Star Steamship Company. And he send them their shares and they put it in a frame and mount it on the wall. They didn't put it in a file cabinet. That's how proud they were to be part of a pan-African organization. So when we were allowed to independently have our internal discussion and debate. We already know what we do before the indoctrination, the subversion, the COINTELPRO came about. We know what our natural choice was. But because white folks said, well, black people got these two schools of thought. 
and white folks threw their support behind Du Bois. Go read uh, Tony Martin's uh, 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 exposés of Du Bois when Du Bois worked with the government to subvert Garvey and the government worked with Du Bois to, to elevate him and his agenda in the ranks of the black community and put him and the white folks that founded the NAACP, put him at the head of it. But Garvey learned. Garvey was one of the few black scholars, one of the few black men who lived to be 90 something years old. And one thing, and you can say all the bad things about Du Bois, and I've probably said it two times before you said it one time. I know the problems with Du Bois, but one thing I gotta say that I have to compliment him on and that I try to emulate is that he was always learning. They talk about you can't teach an old dog new trick. This old dog learned more tricks after he got old before you could learn in your loop. He was always learning and he was a sincere academic. So I found that when he got inform the proper information and analysis, he was willing to make moves. But it, I still think it was too little too late. But in terms of the black agenda, the black agenda was artificially influenced artificially propped up and artificially corrupted by our oppressors. So the black agenda went from Pan-African back to Africa, United uh, UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, to the national, the NAACP. The power, the black influence went from UNIA to the uh, uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And how did they, improvement, we went from improvement to advancement. And what was the difference? Garvey said improve, improvement meant black people building an independent black power base. And at the core of that independent black power base is number one, economic, number two, military. Not only did he have the Black Star Steamship, he also founded the African Legion, armed the black men that for their sole purpose is to protect the life and property of black people from any outside aggression. He had the Black Cross Nurses Association to serve as a support for the African Legion. So his agenda was economic and military at the core, and on top of that will be encased by cultural consciousness. What was Du Bois' agenda? To take 10% of Negroes, send them to white institutions to learn to think white, write, walk, and function as white people, and then they will come back and be the administrators of all other black people to tell all the black laborers all the black masses, how to be and what to be and when to be, the talented 10. And he believed that when he was able to demonstrate the intellectual capacity of the black elites and the industrial capacity of the black masses, then the white people would have no choice but to treat us as equals. That was his agenda. And that has been the agenda for over the last century, since 1919 to 2019. Now Du Bois abandoned this. Why did he abandon it? Because Du Bois went down south and got stomped out by white rednecks. And here's this black man with a monocle, a top hat, and a tuxedo and tails getting stomped out by toothless rednecks and dingy soiled overalls. And he was like, it ain't all the education in the world. And then he also saw that his talented 10th when they went to these institutions of higher learning, all they could figure out to do, only thing they learned is how to properly set a formal dinner table. All they learned how to do is properly tie a, a, a bow tie. As far as being the intellectual counterpart, the philosophy, developing a black intellectual class, a black philosophy, a black administrative and black statecraft, principles and protocols, only thing they could do is go and see who got invited to what cocktail party to see what other awards they could jockey from from white people and what other acknowledgments and form black Greek letter organizations and black lodges and black golf clubs and black yacht clubs. So they were superficially mimicking white people, but they weren't doing any in-depth in power moves that elites are supposed to do. And then he saw that the, the, some toothless redneck and soil overall still had more power than a black first black man to ever get a PhD from Harvard. They stomped him out and nothing happened. So lo and behold, even uh, Du Bois realized his folly, but it was too late because then you had all these other integrationist icons 
So he could not, he, he couldn't kill the beast that he helped to create. And what did he end up doing? He repatriated back to Africa. <laughs> Dubois became a Garveyite. <laughs> as crazy as it sounds. And he moved back to Africa. After stopping our people from making the proper connections with Africa, after subverting the back to Africa movement, Dubois, half a century later, moved to Africa. He didn't move to Germany, where he thought the highest heights of, 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 of European philosophy and intellectual development came out of Germany. He was so proud that he spoke German. He loved the German people. He loved the German culture. But of course, that got sullied during World War II. So he's like, damn, with all that intellect, all that engineering, all of that high culture, they were able to descend to the lowest lows of barbarism and tribalism. But he learned, he kept learning to the, the end of his days. Garvey even, he even ended up becoming a communist. <laughs> you know. And he eventually is like, well, damn, you know, the color line will be the, but anyway, that's how we came to have the integrationist agenda. The integrationist agenda is not a black agenda. It's a white agenda grafted on and carried out by black people. The true black agenda, when black people independently were able to sit amongst ourselves and say, what the hell do we want to do going forward, was a pan-African repatriation agenda. And it still had industrial elements, but it was a repatriation. Now, in over a century, black people have not fully amended this agenda, even though Dubois was like, yo, uh, Garvey was right. He never admitted it, but he lived it. He ain't got to talk it because he lived it. He demonstrated to us that Garvey was right and he was wrong by the way he lived his own life, number one. Number two, Martin Luther King, who took the crown of the greatest integrationists, who surpassed uh, Dubois, Martin Luther King. It was like, I'm integrating my people into a burning house, but it was too little too late. He's like, I can't integrate my people into an empire. I can't integrate my people into a capitalist system. Having close proximity to white people, sitting on the bus next to white folks, sitting in the classroom next to white folks, sitting in the, in the Supreme Court next to white people, is not going to fundamentally change the trajectory of this imperialist, oppressive, omnicidal nation. King was like, yo, I messed up. King tried to correct his mistakes. He did a better job of trying to correct his mistakes than Dubois did and had less time to do it. King literally had one year. And King said that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence. He said that you can't have social justice without economic justice. King reached out to Africa. He went and sat with Kwame and Kuma. He, King did everything he could to try to fix it. And when they saw the King, they were like, we elevated this Negro burrhead. That's what they used to call him. That's what LBJ and, 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 and uh, J. Edgar Hoover used to call uh, their code name for, for Dr. King was burrhead. They were like, we built up this bird head. We put him on our national media. We got, we gave him a photo op sitting in the Oval Office signing legislation. We gave this, this bird head, this mm -hmm bird head, we gave him the Nobel Peace Prize. We set him up to be the king, the godhead of all Negroes. And he's stabbing us in the back. So they killed him. And now the reports say that they didn't kill him with the gunshot in his neck. He reached the hospital, not only alive, fully conscious. And when they brought him into the emergency room, they put a pillow over his head and suffocated him. They don't play. And like I said, they didn't kill King because he was helping black people sit next to white folks. They didn't kill King because he was helping black people go to white institutions to be indoctrinated. They didn't kill King because little white boys and little white girls, they killed King because King became and was evolving into a Pan-African which is the only true threat. Black people being equal, black people being CEOs, black people opening businesses, black people getting degrees, black people becoming chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff like Colin Powell, black people becoming black president of the United States is none of that's a threat to the white status quo. None of that's a threat to global white domination. None of that's a threat to, to uh, white hegemony. None of it. And it could happen. And then we have a black president and racists come out stronger on the other side of it. We have a black man who leads the U.S. military, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a black man sitting at the helm of the most powerful military in the history of the world, and black Africa remains under vicious attack by U.S. imperialism. 
not to count the Caribbean, Central, and, and, and Latin America, which got most of our black people. More black people outside of Africa live in Latin America than live in the, in, in the United States or anywhere else. And Colin Powell unapologetically massacred them. So the only thing that white people seem to identify as a threat is Pan-Africanism, revolutionary Pan-Africanism. We can do anything else. We can join movements like the Nation of Islam and we can run around saying the white man is the devil. But as long as we're not, it's not Pan-Africanist, it can go. We can run a white devil this, white devil that, and kill whitey this, kill whitey that. And we can have our black gun clubs and black shooters. And you could be a black armed black man marching up and down the street with M16s and then go sit on Amy Goodman show, white liberal Amy Goodman show, and talk about your justice and your rights. None of that's a threat. The only thing is a threat is a empowered, independent Africa with the full support and engagement of the African diaspora. That's the only thing that I've seen that every single time it starts to happen, that white people fully mobilize themselves to fight us. So when you go to white daddy, when you go to daddy Bernie, when you go to mama Hillary or mama Jill Stein or even mama or anybody else and say, what's your black agenda? They just like, I can't believe this guy is here asking me what my black agenda is. Isn't it obvious? You're going to be a subordinate, non-competitive, underclass. You will generate revenues, wealth, and give legitimacy to our system. And some of you will be handsomely rewarded, Oprah, Michael Jordan. And the few of you that we handsomely reward, you will not only be a buffer, but you will be a fake Goalpost. You will be evidence of our justice, a, 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 a false symbol, a false idol of American inclusiveness. And even though you're going to get this money, black money don't last two generations. They find that white elites, wealthy white people, as their descendants, as their bloodline goes on, they become richer. They find that white dyna black dynasties degrade. So we can trust that Michael Jordan's grandchildren will not have the wealth that Michael Jordan has. Oprah has no offspring, so we can't run that hustle, but I'm pretty sure all of her money is going to go to white charities and go to white supremacist organizations. Oprah's wealth will not be left to or inherited by anything that's going to enrich or build up black people. So we understand a black agenda should be a pan-African, revolutionary pan-African agenda where we pull our resources. And a black agenda is supposed to be an agenda that is a challenge to the white status quo that is subversive to capitalism and that allows Africa to be the home base and that Africa's resources go to enrich and sustain Africa at home and abroad. And you ain't got to ask Bernie or the Democratic Party about that. We don't need their permission and we don't even need their assistance. And we, so now that we know what white folks agenda for us is and black folks agendas for us. So how do you implement this black agenda? Garvey demonstrated the Black Panthers, you know, to a certain extent, SNCC, and even SCLC and King's at later life, and King's last year, year and a half of life. We have examples. We understand one thing we know about the black agenda. It's a multi-generational agenda. So it will not be, it was not started in your lifetime. It will not be completed in your lifetime. But since we, this whole black agenda stuff came up tied to U.S. politics, let's talk about U.S. politics. When you are already embedded in the black agenda, you don't necessarily need any company, corporation, or anything outside of black people to hold to the black agenda. What you do once you have a black agenda, you can look around at the political landscape and decide what, since we already have our agenda, we're not coming here for our agenda. We're coming here to, to, to determine how any one of these politicians will support or be a hindrance to our agenda. And we ain't going to ask them a damn thing. We're not going to beg them. We're not going to ask them. You look and see what's in the best interest. Now, Bernie, what's Bernie's platform? Bernie wants universal health care, he wants debt relief for all Americans, and he wants the major part of his uh, platform 
and he wants to reorient the taxation system to reduce the burden, the tax burden on the middle class and increase the tax burden on the upper classes. And then he's also throwing around some rhetoric about uh, uh, stronger regulations for Wall Street, the investment in banking industries. And I think he is also wants to separate investment banking from, you know, retail or, or basic banking, which it was before Clinton fused the two. So he basically wants to return to the New Deal. So what you ask him is not go to Bernie and say, Bernie, what about black people? What about the black agenda? What about reparations? What we need to do is say, well, here's Bernie's agenda and here's the black agenda. How is Bernie's agenda consistent with what black people want? It doesn't, we don't need Bernie to embrace the whole black agenda because that's our responsibility. That's something we're going to do irregardless of Bernie. Whether Bernie becomes the president or not, this goes forward. You have two presidents. One says, I embrace the black agenda, which will greatly hurt his prospects for winning. And one says, to hell with the black agenda. They're a bunch of murderers and rapists built the wall of MAGA. And then the MAGA guy won wins. And the black agenda panderer loses. Does that mean we sit down for four years? No. The black agenda goes forward no matter who's in office. Because the black agenda is not theirs. It's not their responsibility. It's not even anything they can influence. So you say, universal health care, does that speak to any of the issues on the black agenda? Are there any overlaps between the black agenda and the Bernie agenda or the DNC or even the Republican? And you say, well, this particular politician has more consistent overlaps where black people can maneuver and position ourselves to extract the direct benefits and feed specifically into our agenda. And that's who you vote based on, not because you love this politician, because you believe this politician. And then you look and see, as I said earlier, which one of these politicians is most vulnerable to us? Trump already said, ain't no black people voting for me. I don't need the black vote. I don't want the black vote and I can get along with the black vote. Not every politician can say that. So like, listen, you don't, you are not a factor unless you get our votes. And you don't come and say, what's your black agenda? You come today and say, these are some specific policy points. These are our top three priorities, and these are our secondary priorities, and these are our tertiary priorities. And if you speak to these top three points, you can get our vote. If you speak to these, these secondary agendas, not only do you get our vote, you'll get our financial support, and we will campaign, and we can put 2,000 black folks on the streets in these particular key areas to make sure you get there. And if for the per peripheral agenda, we'll come, we'll redouble our efforts. So it's a negotiation. It ain't about love. It's about power. It's about resources. It's about being able to reward your allies and punish your enemies. It ain't about what's right and wrong. Roll the blood clot up, black folks. I'm not telling y'all to vote for Bernie. I'm not voting for Bernie. At this point, I'm voting for Jay Inslee. Why am I voting for Jay Inslee? Because he has a black agenda? No. Because he supports reparations? No. I'm voting for Jay Inslee because Jay Inslee said my number one priority is global warming. I will have a full, my sole purpose for running for president is to reverse and reduce carbon emissions and reverse the eco side. Will he do it? I don't know. But he's the only one that says he's going to do it. And the fact that he publicly said he's going to do it when he gets in and doesn't do it, we'd be in a better position to push him towards it than anybody else. And he does have a track record of having really progressive ecological policies. And I tell you what, more important than anything else in the world right now, it's preserving the planet's life-sustaining capacity. I don't care if we all got reparations, we all got integrated, we all got scholarship, full scholarships to Harvard and Yale and these other backwards ass white institutions. None of that will matter if we can't breathe the air, we can't drink the water and the soil can't produce food. So my main priority, the number one priority for the black agenda is preserving the life sustaining capacity, because whether we're liberated or enslaved, it don't matter on a dead planet. So what's what whose agenda is most consistent? I don't need him to say black, bleed black or 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 or, or put hot sauce in his bag to play the saxophone on some Negro coon minstrel show. I don't even need to talk to him or interact with him directly. I'm saying, huh, this dude in serving his own interest overlaps with my interest.
we ain't friends. I don't have no love for this old generic white dude. He don't have no love for me, but our interests align for this time. And the moment our interests start to diverge, then we go back to beating the hell out of each other. But when our interests align, we move ahead. You know, this ain't no super friends. This ain't no Justice League. No people, no, no people have permanent allies. We only have permanent interests. Clark told you, told us, told y'all, y'all not listening. It's embarrassing to see all these black people, these, these, these hip slick, natural hair, uh, woke AF, black people standing in front of these crackers talking about what's your black agenda? What are you gonna do for black people? You don't say, what do you do? What, what you gonna do for black people and put a question mark. You put an exclamation point like this here is what you gonna do for black folks. And if you fail to do it, this will be your punishment. And if you do do it, this will be your reward. That's all that matters. We still think reparations is about morality. I'm gonna have to do a whole show on reparations. Y'all playing. So the way we implement a black agenda is simply by prioritizing a black agenda. I got a horrible secret for black folks. Everything we organize ourselves to do, we succeed in doing. Nobody can stop us. We got off the damn plantation. We buried Jim Crow. We even got the presidency. The problem is we fight for the wrong stuff. And the reason we fight for the wrong stuff is because we keep allowing reactionary elements in our community to rise to the top. Yeah, cream floats, but so does feces. And we got all these reactionary leaders misdirecting our interests and our resources. That's the problem. And, 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 and I'm not even going to talk about the COINTELPRO, the, 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 the assassinations, the, the false imprisonment, because white people have been attacking us. That's a given. If we start to organize and implement our revolution, the sun's going to rise. The wind's going to blow and white people are going to relentlessly, viciously attack and subvert it. Those are all givens. Those are three things you can depend on. You can depend on sun, gravity, and white folks trying to subvert us. So that's a given. And then you can't claim. It's like uh, George Jackson said. If you organize for black liberation and you don't prepare for white subversion, you either stupid or you have a death wish. So every time we organize and everything I do, I don't care if it's something as minor as a book club, a business cooperative, or making real political ties with my brothers and sisters on the continent. I always prepare for the corrupting elements. That's where you come in with statecraft. That's why we have to stop having these charismatic individual leaders and we need to start erecting protocols, standards, and make that. The agenda should be the leader. The agenda, the agenda should guide us, not any individual. Even if an individual rises to the rank of leadership over any black movement, he should be replaceable. He should be disposable. And every leader should be defined by one thing. How well do you advance the agenda? I don't care how good you speak. I don't care how righteous you are. I don't care how educated, how this is the agenda. Black liberation. In the year you took power, every two, three, four years, we do an assessment. Under your leadership, have we advanced? Have we stagnated or have we regressed? That's all I wanna know. I don't want to know how many marches you organize, then how many millions of people show up at your march. I don't want to know how many times you stood behind a podium or in a TV camera and told white folks like it is. All I want to know is since you took power, Mr. Black Leader, have we advanced, stagnated, or regressed towards our specific agenda? How many specific boxes are you able to check on the Black Agenda checklist? That's not how we evaluate leaders. That's not how we do it. So, we, I mean, we got some time. We spend a lot of time outside of power. So we're not even comfortable with power. We're more comfortable with appealing to power, trying to integrate with power 
as opposed to exercising and cultivating power from within. And I don't hold that against us. Because there was a time just reading a book could get you decapitated, could get your tongue cut out. You know, there was a time where simply asserting our basic humanity could have our genitals cut off and have us burned alive. So I understand how a people under genocidal oppression of Europeans could have issues with power, with cultivating and implementing agendas, with organizing. And for a long time, we had to preoccupy ourselves with basic survival, where simply your skin tone and your hair texture would be a mortal threat to you through existence. I understand. But the problem is we thought that we could take some time off to heal. And then after we all get healed, after we all become conscious, after we all fall back in love with ourselves, after we all become aware, then we could do, go do our struggle. But Franz Fanon taught us. Or I'll put it, healing in the killing, medicine in the murder, as Dr. Khalid Muhammad said. We have to do it. You don't get healed through struggle. You struggle through healing and you heal through struggle. Stop asking the Democratic Party to represent black people. Don't ask anybody for a damn thing. We don't have to ask for a damn thing. We make demands. And if we're not in a position to make demands, then our agenda is not to make demands. Our agenda is get into a position where we can make demands. What is required? What does the Democratic Party respond to? How is the Democratic Party structured? How is the Democratic Party vulnerable to black people? What does the Democratic Party gain from black people? What do we have that they need? And what can we get from them by leveraging what they need from us? It's not even complex. It's so unbelievably stupid. I start to tremble when I think about it, how much potential power we have to dictate our demands to the Democratic Party, where we don't have to ask them for a damn thing. But then again, we also, we keep sending these scumbags back to office. Bobby Rush, the Congressional Black Caucus, Maxine Waters, and I, I don't hate Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters is truly a tragic figure. To be honest with you, if you look at her voting record, I would never vote for Maxine Waters, but I understand. She's on that Spike Lee. She do the right thing. For eight years under the Clinton administration, she voted against Clinton's policies while supporting Bill Clinton. And I don't know how you do that. She tried to stand up and say, tell the Clintons, well, it's not right what y'all doing to black folks. And when they had the welfare reform, NAFTA and GATT, the, the, the omnibus crime bill, she voted against it like a good little politician. But then after voting against it, she go out to the podium and endorse the Clintons after voting against half their damn policies. And that's where many of us are in relationship to the Democrats. She couldn't go to the, hey, Bill, you do this, I'm coming for you. She came for, 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 uh, Trump, and before she came for Trump, she came for, for, for George Bush. But she's subverted, and, and the real party that she's a member of, she has no power, and, no, and she has no voice in her own party, but she got all this strength to fight against the Republicans. It doesn't make sense, and that's how many of us function in this system. She's a tragic figure. So she can come back to us and say, well, I voted against all these horrible anti-black policies, but they all passed. Yeah, so what do we do now? How do we punish the Democrats? So just like the, we don't have a white agenda, can you imagine if black people had a white agenda if I came to y'all and said, listen, I sat at home and I researched and I studied and I worked all night and I've got this wonderful white agenda do you think any white person will come to me and be like, can I have your white agenda? Like, here you go, Bob. And well, thank you. When have you ever seen a white person come to even a black, even when Obama took power, even when a black man was, was the chief executive of the empire, did any white person ever come, what's your agenda for white people? In fact, they already knew this boy better have our agenda. And even though Obama had a white agenda, Obama advanced a white agenda, and Obama was successful 
at advancing a white agenda, they still hated him and cursed him and called him a monkey and said he was from Kenya and called him a socialist. These same white people who he was serving would hang egophies of him, would have lynchings, lynch, you know, dress up a, a mannequin to look like Obama and lynch it. And he still kept pushing forward that white agenda. And everybody knows how well Israel does in the United States, how well the Zionists do in the United States. When you ever stand up and say, Zionists come to America and say, America, what's your Zionist agenda? What's your Jewish agenda? They don't come and ask, when have you, it, it's, do I have a call? I have a call. One moment. Caller, you're live on the Bro Diallo Show. State your name or alias and where you're calling from. Good morning. This is ML calling from St. Louis. What's up, sister? Oh, I just wanted to call and get my two cents because, you know, that's all I got. I'm pretty broke. So, um, we're talking about this black agenda and voting. And um, here's my thing with, with, with black people. Um, we have this mindset to, to in thinking that voting equals politics and voting actually means something. And it does not. So, we get up. We go vote, we get a button, we take a picture, put it on Facebook, oh, I voted, and then it goes sit your ass down and you don't do nothing else. And these people in state capitals and they're in D.C. doing anything and everything to you, and you have no idea because you're not following up, you're not calling, you're not visiting, you're not emailing, you're not doing anything. The fact that you voted, you know, you, you did something. And I'm just so tired of people with this, uh, you know, I voted so... That, that's it. That's not the entirety of politics. That's literally like the first step. You actually have to take, you know, many more steps before things get accomplished. You know, and um, I personally didn't vote this last thing, uh, um, election cycle because I wasn't able to. But I'm one of the, you know, most active people in my area as far as politics is concerned. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand this. And I'll put out a call to people and say, you know, we're going to the state capitol, we're trying to get this passed, that passed, we're trying to hold these people's feet to the fire, and don't nobody want to do nothing, don't nobody want to get involved, don't nobody, you know, oh, good luck, but that's it. But as soon as these laws, and in my state, they recently passed a couple of pretty, you know, horrible um, um, policies, it's not passed, but it went through the House and not the Senate. But anyway, so they passed the things, and people don't know anything about it, then next year when this stuff is in effect, everybody's going to be mauling and groaning. You know, so it, it's like if you're not going to um, hold the people's feet to the fire that you elect, you might as well set your ass at home and not even want to poll. It, it doesn't even make any sense. Yeah, I totally uh, agree. You're right. You're right, sister. I, I totally agree. I've been doing working on political education for the longest, and we got this pendulum. People go from one extreme, voting is our salvation, to the other extreme, I don't vote, it don't mean nothing. And it's, I don't know why we can't have a balanced understanding of, of, of U.S. politics. We've been here too long to be so infantile in our approach to politics. Yeah, you're definitely right about that. But that's all I wanted to add in. Um, but I am listening and supporting, and... Um, um, you have a great day. You too, sister. Um, thank All you right. for calling. I hope to hear from you again yeah. soon. All right. Okay, bye -bye. So that's Sister ML. I think we could wrap it up on it. The final points are the agenda is ours. It belongs to us. It comes out of our community, and it will be implemented by our community. We don't go ask anyone outside of the black community what their agenda for black people is. That is an insult to ourselves, and it makes us even more vulnerable to their insidious agendas. We already know they have a black agenda, and regardless of what they say, we have over 200 years of active engagement with these people to know what their plan and agenda for us is. What is our agenda for ourselves? After that's clarified, how will, do we implement this agenda? Who are our allies and who are our enemies? And every day, every week, every minute, we have to reassess. Every time, sometimes people that have been our enemies, sometimes we can align with them and we'll have an allegiance. Sometimes people who are our allies have to get the enemy treatment. Our agenda is liberation. Our agenda is pan-Africanism. And sometimes it requires us to support a political party that we can hold our noses in both. Sometimes it requires us to extract and withhold our vote. Sometimes it requires us to put, put money up. Sometimes it requires us to take money out. 
Sometimes it requires us to, to peacefully march. Sometimes it requires us to burn stuff down. But whatever the agenda requires, the agenda leads us. Not no man, not no woman, not some charismatic figure. Our agenda is what leads us. Our agenda is what we pass down to our descendants. And as we achieve our agenda, then we go into preservation of our liberation. Once we secure liberation, we preserve, we entrench our liberation. Anyway, Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. You can support progressive pan-African analysis and show. Keep this show on the air. This is Q4 Radio that I'm broadcasting on on the AM 1680 signal if you live in the city of Chirac. If you're outside of the city of Chirac or our broadcast area, you can download the TuneIn app and iTunes radio and simply uh, uh, search Q4. Or you can listen anytime, anywhere on the Q4 website. If you want to hear archives, past shows, you can go to DialoKenyatta.com where shows are archived. If you want access to the full years and years of, of shows going all the way back to my debut broadcast of the Bro Diallo Show, you can go on and become a Patreon supporter. And not only do you get full access and some other rewards, you will also be helping to sustain the Bro Diallo Show to make sure I'm here every Monday Wednesday and Friday, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, um, um, Central Standard Time. I appreciate my listeners. I even more so appreciate my subscribers. I even more so appreciate the people who not only subscribe but share the show. And I super duper appreciate the people who subscribe, share the show, and make a one-time donation or become Patreon supporters because you guys make it possible for me to be here. You guys are who I work for and struggle for on behalf of and, and struggle with. Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. We're going to have some King Sun. Uh, after King Sun, we will be back on the air uh, Friday morning, and I think we might have to talk about reparations. I thought we were pretty clear on that. Um, shout out to Conrad Warrill, Brother Ham, Cam, uh, um, brother uh, Samori Bill Grace the true reparation pan-African reparationist middle finger to all these DOS isolationist reparationists and they not fighting for reparations like I said they fighting for a bro buyout anyway bro Diallo show I see y'all in Africa back to the motherland <laughs>